So uh, today what we're covering is kind of the overview of Rocklin, the game design of Rocklin. We're going to talk about what Rocklin is, what makes it special, the different features and systems in Rocklin, uh, the theme, setting, story, art style, music examples. We won't really play music, but just kind of talk about what the theme of the music will go through. And then we'll kind of finish up with the business model, or also known as monetization. Um, and at the very end, uh, we'll go through Q&A. There'll be plenty of time for Q&A. And more importantly, I mean, great, love to answer all your questions, but I'm really looking for feedback on the game design and the different aspects of it. What do you think is going to work? What do you think is not going to work? Did I miss something that I should be considering? Things like that. Um, whether you're a player or a game developer, I, I'm always looking for feedback and, and taking that into consideration. So feel free again to put that into the que uh, your questions in the questions for presentation channel, or, or feel free to ask at the end. It'd be nice if you put uh, prefix them with question uh, in brackets, or kind of mention me at, at Mike C so that we can scroll through them pretty quickly and find uh, what hasn't been answered. So what is Rockland? Well, it starts off uh, with as an open world. Sorry, I have notes and there's a meme. Technical difficulties. So Rockland is an MMORPG. It's set in the future where players discover that magic is real and is causing global conflict. Players are invited to join Rockland Institute, where they'll learn magic, explore lost lands, specialize different magical crafts, and shape what the world will be like by taking part in a magical war. Um, and you might be, I can hear you already, Mike, one does not simply make an MMO. Like, what are you doing? You're a solo indie developer. Why are you making an MMO? And you would be 100% correct. Um, there's also the question of what, why is an indie MMO going to be better than all the other MMOs? Why is someone going to play Rockland versus another game? And I really wanted to focus on what is what makes Rockland special, what is different from Rockland. And I think at the core of it is our focus on gameplay, lore, and story is going to enable players to come together throughout the world and create this living, immersive, Harry Potter, air quotes-esque world, this fantasy that we've been grown uh, many of us grew up with uh that we wanted to be part of and there are harry potter games uh but i wanted to provide a world where the players come together they create the experience together and the world becomes this immersive expansive uh world and that just it gets classified as an mmo to go into more detail about different things is immersion we really are, are trying to design our systems to make them feel rewarding and realistic. A lot of games, especially where there are spells that are uh, involved, you're pushing uh, your one key on your keyboard or your two, three, four, or five to select a different spell, wait for a cooldown, and then you push that key again and you select where it's going. Well, I wanted to kind of change that up and try to focus away from cooldowns and focus more towards player skill, where it's going to take some time for you to do the thing, but it has more reward, more realism. And so you can see here, spell casting, we'll talk a little bit more, but here is an example of a gesture, a pattern being casted, and that spell is going to be cast. So you can have player skill and sometimes memory that's going to provide a more immersive um, gameplay. And then another example, which we'll talk into more detail later, is potion brewing is going to feel more like cooking rather than let's select a couple of different items, throw them in a bin, and click craft potion. I'd like to create a system where uh, ingredient preparation is going to have effects on your potion so that you're not having one set a uh, collection of things gives you output, but the preparation matters, the order matters, and you don't have to, it's not going to be perfect. You can change that over time uh, and, and perfect your recipe uh, as you decide to squeeze something versus cut it. We'll have really deep lore, and so that's going to be things like 
You're going to have spells and potions that are optional to the main gameplay, but they're going to be hidden away in books. Imagine picking up a book that's uh, cleaning for magical people, and in the footnotes, someone wrote a spell uh, that they were thinking about that's going to help you uh, clean the rust off of a ancient gate that's preventing you from getting into a certain area. But that area wasn't necessary for the main gameplay, but there's some really awesome stuff behind that, and you wouldn't have known how to get in there had you not found it in that book. There's going to be all different types of op optional lore and game elements uh, also referenced in, in real life, IRL media. So consider reading a, a famous novel is referenced in the game and you got to go read a certain passage in that and you know the community will put that somewhere if you don't want to go buy the book or go visit the library and this would definitely be optional but it really provides this idea of immersing yourself in the world by giving you more opportunities to interact with the world rather than just at the keyboard and, or, or with the gamepad. Not sure exactly how that's all going to fit in, but these are kinds of things that I'm thinking about to make sure that we can pro build a deep lore system. And then everything in the game is going to have a deeper meaning, a deeper explanation, and that includes the magic. So a lot of systems, a lot of stories, a lot of things that have magic in them are very, you know, magic exists, and then there you go. And while Rockland will introduce magic that way, there is a deep explanation that has some soft science, with big air quotes on that, of why certain things happen the way they do, and you explore those ways throughout the uh, exploring through the game. And really it comes down to is we're focused on making this world feel somewhat realistic and, and even plausible. Maybe not possible, but plausible that this world in the future could actually happen, that, that magic has always existed and you're actually trying to um, you as a player are getting this itch scratched of becoming that wizard, getting that letter in the mail and uh, and figuring out what you can do with 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 magic. Another part that we're really focusing on is agency. An agency, for those that are not familiar with the term, is the ability of choice, that your choices matter and they affect the world or your opportunities or things like that. So imagine yourself where you are aligned with one faction, say Rockland Institute, which we'll talk about more later, and you tell someone off, the, uh, a, a researcher there. And you get heard by uh, an NPC who's part of secretly part of the other faction, and only because you chose that choice to have this what would feel like a punishment at first, because you're 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 pu you're telling someone to to get lost. Uh, that's going to give you a new opportunity for that NPC to now invite you to join the other faction. And these kind of choices will be intertwined throughout the entire storyline uh, to be able to give you more abilities for uh, for choosing your path. It is not just an MMO, but an MMORPG, that role-playing game. And we really want to give you the ability to, to actually play that role. We'll have multiple systems and mechanics to specialize in. And we'll talk about these a little bit more uh, in detail, but uh, including just potions and spells and things like that, well, there's going to be deep lore, so there's going to be ingredients all throughout the universe. You have to go explore these different nooks and crannies of the world, and maybe that's all you want to do in the game is go find those different things uh, to be able to make those potions. But you're, it's not necessarily like a built-in profession in the game, but um, it does enable you to be able to spend a lot of time specializing in different part, different systems in the game. We would, uh, we would like to see that you can uh, progress your character through the world by uh, not participating in the main story. So if you're just interested in casual play, but you still want to get those powerful spells, I'm not sure what that would look like, but that is something we are definitely considering. And then it's an MMO, Massively Multiplayer Online. You have a huge social opportunities here 
And uh, it kind of goes through uh, the first point comes back from that last slide. You have all these people that can special all these deep systems that people can specialize in. But now you have people in the world that you can trade with. So you have someone that's uh, collecting the ingredients. They're doing the exploration and discovery and someone that's a potion master that understands the ingredients and sits there and, t and figures out how to use them to make the best potion that then can be traded to another user who is uh, fighting uh, the, the big monster or whatever it is. Uh, and so this creates not just an economy, which we'll have to carefully understand the implications of that, but it creates a, a, a world that really just comes, it's more than the sum of the parts. We're designing all these systems and hoping it all comes together, but it really is the social aspect that brings it out. And in, in more than just having players in the server, we're going to have... I don't know if the final name is called a guild, but it's commonly known as a guild in MMOs, where you have a, a, a group of people, it could be, you know, two, or it could be a thousand, where you can join this guild, and through the guild, you can have, like, a shared guild wallet and build a customizable guild hall, kind of like your own little Hogwarts, where it's custom, you know, you can theme the outside and things like that. Maybe you have secret passageways in your guild hall and things like that. Um... You can use as part of being as being part of a guild. There will be guild events where one guild versus another guild could have uh, like a PvP arena kind of battle, or there could be global events where guilds come together or they split apart and create alignment in different factions, and uh, their choices can help shape what the new opportunities and change in the storyline would be. I don't know if that means that we're building this huge storyline that's flexible constantly of like this, these guilds choose one faction versus the other faction. And we'll talk about factions a little bit later. Um, and that's going to completely change the story. And my story that's built into the game has to be able to accommodate that. I think that's a lot of content to build. Um, but I do think that we can have other things where let's say you vote for your there's a, an event where uh, you people are proposing that you go destroy the houses of the other faction or something like that. And your guild can vote on that and internally and provide uh, this, like, we vote to do it or we vote not to do it. Maybe it doesn't actually happen or maybe it does happen. Um, but the actual impact of you voting within your guild and your guild's overall vote can actually open up a new opportunity for a new quest, a new alignment, new uh, NPC uh, interactions and things like that, that that might open up other opportunities that could be built in rather than, so we're not changing the persistent world, but we're still opening up new doors because of these choices that you're making alongside your other guild members. And on top of all of this, we're building the game so that it is flexible with the number of people you're playing with whether it's by yourself or with a group. And that comes from, you know, the guild has is the bigger uh, persistent home base kind of thing, but what's your day-to-day -day like? Maybe it's just you and a, three other friends that you're close friends. You're playing the game together as group play, as party play, and you're doing the quest together uh, rather than with your entire guild. Or maybe you just wanted to, like, your, your, your friends are busy for the week, so you're going to go play solo for a little bit. So those were kind of like the main points of Rockland, but there's so much more. I, and we'll start off with that, uh, the, the different aspects of Rockland that makes Rockland Rockland. It's focused on magic, so you're not going to really see uh, a lot of bows and arrows and axes and swords. They'll exist, but they will probably uh, be limited to NPCs or there'll be a special bow that's necessary to do this one quest. Uh, but we're trying to stick to a magic, a mage class, a major class that's just being a, ma uh, a mage, a wizard. And you can do magic and you can specialize in that class, but not really have a, uh, a sword based class, a ranger or things like that. You can maybe still be a ranger because of the different spells that you focus on. 
but uh, it wouldn't be uh, bows, for example. We talked a lot a, a bit about the lore, uh, but it's still something that we're heavily focused on. There will be a lot of different biomes and areas, so it's not just this, it, it's open world, but it's not just one area or a large portion of that area. We're focusing on it's a global thing and you're going to travel the world and we won't build a world sized map, but we will provide uh, different areas that you can travel to, to give you a, a lot of opportunity and variety throughout the game. And there'll be some examples of what that might look like uh, later on. Really focus on providing a free or cheap entry point. And we'll talk about this more in monetization, but I think it's important to, uh, at, as a, as as a main point of Rockland, we're trying to build a uh, a game that is focused on allowing to have a lot of players, regardless of their financial position, or maybe they're young and don't have a credit card and can't pay to play the game, or or something along those lines. We want to be able to uh, provide them the ability to enjoy the game. Uh, and, and try to balance that to make sure the game, can, the studio can actually operate. But the whole point of me building this game was to kind of escape from my nine to five. And I wanted to build this magical world because I, I grew up with uh, this magic fan uh, franchise. And while we won't be recreating Harry Potter, we definitely want to provide uh, that immersive itch that uh, we all want to, you know, many people want to live in. It wouldn't be like a simu life simulator, but it, it definitely will be uh, something that we're giving those opportunities. And that's also going to open up other opportunities for the players that are paying for the game, have, you know, a, the free players end up being content. It, it's that social aspect. Having those people there is important for the game to actually operate. I don't know if we need tens of thousands of people online to make this game enjoyable, uh, but I think it does allow uh, a richer gameplay for everyone. We're looking at targeting Windows and Mac natively, and I think Linux is definitely on the target. Our servers will be on Linux, uh, but so I don't see why the cl clients can't. Uh, but we're just going to make sure that we keep pushing forward to support Linux. Uh, but it is the least amount of support in our survey, but we'll see what we can do. I'm a Linux fan myself, so we'll see. Uh, console support is something we want, uh, but it does require a lot of work, a lot, probably a lot more than adding Linux support. Uh, but we are trying to make sure that we're building the game in a way that can at least support a gamepad on your desktop and um, like an Xbox controller connected to your desktop. Or and and if by doing that, maybe we can build for console support down the down the road. We talked about how it's going to be online multiplayer and you're going to have this group and party play and you're going to have all these awesome guilds. We talked about MMO. Well, that would mean like there's public servers. I don't know if it's one or more, but um, more than that, it's private scale. We're going to also be able to provide private scalable and moddable servers. I think this is really big opportunity here for people that want to play with friends, but don't want to play with everyone in the world. They would like to just have their one world with their, you know, five to 20 friends. Or maybe there's a content creator who has a huge community and wants their own dedicated server. Well, we have the ability for that. Instead of people hacking Rockland to make their own, to make private servers available, we're just going to officially make it available for people uh, to do themselves. And since they're private servers, we can make them moddable. We're designing Rockland to uh, in a way that for me to add content to the game, I'm making mods to the game. And by focusing on that development path, uh, it enforces me to make sure that down the road we can easily add players to have a mod developer kit and build some really interesting mods for Rockland. So I wanted to kind of go down into the different systems and, and focus on 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 those specifically here, spell casting is kind of your forefront mechanic. 
It's how you interact with the majority of the world. It's how you're going to do combat. It's how you're going to get through different areas and things like that. Uh, and I talked earlier about different casting methods and making them more skill based. Well, the first one is quick cast. This would be available for some subset of spells. I, I don't know the percentage. Maybe it's some 20 to 40% of all spells can be quick cast spells. Um, and this is a from those 20 to 40 percent of spells that you have learned throughout the game you can assign three to five of them of your favorite ones or the ones that you're prepared you're going into a dungeon and you were like okay well i need to change my quick cast uh palette of spells because i know this dungeon's gonna ha need is dark so i need my light spell uh or things like that and these are things that you don't have to remember the pattern for when they are assigned to your your quick cast uh, palette, I don't know if that's the real word for it down the road, but uh, this would give you the opportunity to just uh, have some sort of uh, ability to just get it into a, a zone. And so you can see here, there's like a white line in the top right image. We have like a white line that's horizontal, and uh, there's this green section in the middle of it. And you cast the spell successfully when. Uh, you get it in the green zone, and there's an indicator. It's hard to see bouncing back and forth. Um, maybe it's not a line. Maybe it's a circle. I, I'm not sure. This is kind of just a prototype. But the purpose here is to be able to not have to remember every spell, but also give you something that's skill-based. It's about timing the release in that. And more difficult spells will have a smaller green region. That green region would move from from cast to cast. So it's giving you this variety of gameplay that allows you to get better yourself from a mechanical standpoint, and your character will progress, and that can change down the road of what that feels like and how easy it is to cast different types of spells. That it would be that's your main spell casting uh, mechanic, but then there's also gesture casting, and you can see that example again on the bottom right here of drawing a pattern of any spell at any point during the game. And this allows you to just, as long as you know the spell, you can cast it. These are for the people that, you know, couldn't fit on your uh, quick cast, but you're, you have this one spell, a couple spells memorized that you use frequently, and you decided they're not necessary to put on the quick cast because they don't use them all the time, but they're good to have. And it could be for the other people that really want to dive in and learn and master and memorize all the different spells that are available. Not sure if this is the exact interface that you're going to see in the end game, but we're, we're trying to make sure that we provide an interface that is similar for both mouse uh, and for the gamepad. Then we would, um, so on top of all of that, we've been kind of playing with different ways of doing this. It's kind of hard to aim at something while also getting the skill-based thing. So it would be nice to have a charging of the spell for so that you can charge it up and then have a split moment to aim and then let it go. Um, I'm not sure what this would look like. And maybe as you get more skilled with that particular spell and for your level in general, that length of time that you can hold a charged spell can increase over time. So, and then you would discover spells from multiple sources, whether that's through a quest or maybe you find a book that is in part of the loot of some quest, or maybe it was hidden on a shelf that you didn't have to you know, you have to didn't have to go pick up that book. And in that book, there's uh, details of mastering this very powerful spell that you can, maybe there's a missing page and you have to go find those missing pages. And that could give you a whole, a whole different side quest that um, is part of the game. You could also trade it from players who so maybe you discovered something with your, your and, and you would like to share it with your quest members or your party members. I'm not sure how this really works and does it, kind of unfoil the fun of finding everything because everyone can go share spells with everyone. I'm not really sure, but it would be kind of cool if your friend is joining you for this uh, for this quest that maybe they're not right ready for, or they need a spell to be able to do it. Well, you could maybe even temporarily share that spell with them or something like that. There's no real reason why in the real world other than 
the spell's more difficult to cast, but there's no reason why you, as the player, wouldn't be able to be able to cast a pattern and, or, and you know, say something. We won't have vocal spells, at least not now, but maybe down the road, but just as an example. More or less, we're trying to design a system without cooldowns or mana, and but we're trying to make sure that we do this in a fair and balanced way. We don't want people to spam spells. Um, and so we're trying to elongate the casting part uh, to balance out things. More complex spells take longer to cast. You're vulnerable for longer, and therefore you might not use them as, as often. And that would maybe get away for cooldowns. I don't know if we'll have no cooldowns. Maybe some very powerful spells might have like very long cooldowns. Maybe like you have a daily that can do some real serious damage. But, you know, we'll see where that goes. Potion brewing is an interesting concept. Um, there are a lot of different ways that potion brewing is implemented in several different games. Um, and I kind of wanted to make this a more rewarding experience where potions have take more time to brew, but they have a much more meaningful impact. I kind of don't want to design a system where you're carrying 30 different health po buff potions. Uh, I think there should be a health potion, but I think it should really be that you use it when you're on your, your last whim and you can only carry one because it takes a really long time to brew. And that is your, 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 uh, like your fairy in a bottle. If we're thinking legend of Zelda as your, your lifesaver. But I'm, so I'm trying to create an experience where it rewards you with large impacts for the time that you take. And that makes it that the brewing experience ends up being a bit more enjoyable to do something more than just throwing a bunch of ingredients in different slots and say a uh, brew potion. And I, th I guess I kind of got lost, but anyways, there will be a large list of ingredients and potions. Um, not everything's going to be necessary to play the game. And <clears throat> I think it's kind of cool for people to know that there's more out there and that we continue to make more uh, ingredients and potions. Uh, it'd be kind of neat to know that some potions never get brewed, or, or or it's, you know, it takes a couple months for one person to figure out it, and it takes uh, a really long time to brew, and it's really hard to brew and things like that. It would be kind of interesting to have some more rare potions, not from a discoverability perspective, but also a skill and time point. But the reward is so much greater than that. And then there was that those different methods for ingredients is going to give you that variety in potions. Squeezing versus squeezing a lime versus cutting it in half could have a totally different effect. Maybe uh, getting that more juice into the potion is going to help balance it. Or maybe you need to crush uh, your basil leaves instead of um, throwing them in as is. I'm not sure what those really look like and how it really happens, but uh, it would be really interesting to have different effects based on those different methods. The brewing order matters, so whether you put in something, uh, your, your lemon before the basil, that's going to change if you put the basil before the lemon. It won't be important for every single thing you put in, um, but I think it's kind of makes sense where you're progressing this potion from one stage to the next stage. And logically, if you were to I don't, be doing chemistry, it really makes difference as you progress this potion through its life cycle to the final to the final um, representation. Balancing uh, multiple properties is going to be necessary. So whether that's acidity or color or it is calming or f fire re uh, re resistance and things like that. I have ideas of a lot of different properties to go here. Some might not be applicable to all potions and things like that, but it'd be kind of cool to be able to balance those. And if you get out of a certain zone, the potion can fail, whether it's blow up in your face and you have to go get some new potion gear or it just goes foul or maybe you don't even know it failed and then you try it and it does something weird 
I'm not sure exactly what that looks like, and it's probably going to change from potion to potion. The recipes in game will not always be perfect, um, and so I'm really kind of thinking of, if you ever watched the Harry Potter series, or, or read the books, more importantly, uh, in the Half-Blood Prince, uh, Harry is finds um, a book that would, has a bunch of footnotes about how to do the recipes slightly different to make it more successful. And I think it'd be kind of cool where the recipes that are given to you in game will work, but they might not be the most powerful. You might not know that. You might have to actually uh, try different things uh, based on what you've learned in other different recipes. Be like, oh, well, this recipe has it for doing, I, it says I should peel the skin first before squeezing it, or things like that. And if you try those things and you get this more powerful potion, you're like, oh, wow, that's kind of cool. You could share that with your friends, and now you have this you know, social uh, experience happening also at the same time. And then you would be able to say, this is a very labor-intensive process, and I would want to make sure that you're not spending way too much time. So I'd like you to be able to save recipes for reference if you want to perfect them later, or automating them. Automation wouldn't be like, okay, brew potion, here's all the ingredients, do all the things. I think it would still be time-based, where you, just, you put a potion, and you have this magic stir that's going to do the automation for you and you can come back in an hours of server time uh, before it's finished brewing. So you still have to wait for that, um, but um, something along those lines. We'll have different crafting systems in the game. These will be both for aesthetic purposes, so you want your wand to look kind of cool, but also functional. And we have like a wand crafting prototype, and there's a video of that on the YouTube channel, and I can post a link um, later if you're interested. But I would like it so that the width or the length of wand isn't going to really give you better performance, but it's going to change the different properties. Some spells might be better than other spells if the wand is longer, and vice versa. I want you to be able to maybe not have this one wand that you live with forever, mm -hmm but you have maybe an arsenal of different things that are necessary for different th uh, different types of spells and different abilities. I'm not sure what that exactly looks like and how it's going to work in the system, but it would be really, really neat to be able to have that in the game. We'll have staff crafting would be very similar to wand crafting. Um, and I have brooms here. Br brooms will, flying brooms will kind of exist. And, but they won't be like you think of a a typical stick with bristle at the end tied up. Maybe when you first learned to fly in a broom, it would be like that, and it'd be kind of like, this is how my grandma flew on brooms. But, you know, why fly in brooms when you can fly on a comfortable padded seat speeder? Um, and maybe you could craft that and have cool different speeders and things like that. So I'm kind of thinking of the design here in the bottom right, more uh, similar to like a Star Wars speeder bike, but magical. Um, and having different customizations can make it faster or more, it can take turns quicker or things like that. Not sure what that looks like. Nothing has really been made yet other than that piece of picture. Uh, spell crafting would be really, really interesting. I don't really know exactly what that would be like, whether it's a... You can craft combos where you can make your own pattern that will do a combo of spells. Or maybe you can say, I want the acidity of this and the fire of that, and now you make poison fire. I, I don't know exactly what that looks like, and that may be designed later in the game, in the development process. Um, but it would be really interesting to give people uh, some spell crafting options. Quests are a big thing uh, in an MMO, in an RPG, and I would love to spend more time on that, but I don't really know the details specifically. Um, I'm spending a lot of time talking to my brother who plays more MMOs and trying to figure out what does a good questing system look like? What does questing with a party look like? Can you join a quest in the middle of the quest? Can you leave in the middle of the quest? What happens when you play a quest with five players, uh, but you have to go uh, because it's 2 a.m. and the rest of your group is crazies and they're going to continue and finish the quest. 
well, what do you, how do how do you finish the quest? Do you have to start at the beginning from your own? Can you start in the middle by yourself? I'm not sure what that exactly looks like. I think there's a lot of things here that need to be thought about that usually aren't thought about in MMOs. A lot of games solve this problem by everyone does the quest by themselves, but they do it individually as a group. Uh, so they just keep they do the spells together and move through the world to, or the quest together. Um, I think that's kind of hap- like it's just there's so much missing opportunity there of that layer of immersion. It'd be much cooler if the person you're talking to that's giving you the quest is addressing you as a group and the camera pans and you see the whole group standing there. And I think that little bit of detail, which from a execution perspective, that's easy to have that camera panning around. But it's a more difficult question about how that quest actually gets designed, how the quest system is designed to help us build quests. So really don't know how the answers to this yet, and we're act- really working on figuring this out. Happy to talk more about this um, afterwards um, if you have ideas. Mini games are really cool. These aren't exactly the things we're thinking of, but uh, just some examples of different ways that players can pass time in the game without playing the game, whether that's, you know, an obstacle course or maze, there's racing, or in-game tabletop games, you know, think wizard's chess, but not wizard's chess, because we shouldn't put wizard's chest in there. But something along those lines can be actually you're building this whole other gaming aspect to a game, and it provides a lot of variety there. Duels are obvious, and arena play, if you did like a quest or guild versus guild arena, would be kind of really interesting. Um, And even maybe scavenger hunts. Who knows? I think there's a lot of opportunities here. I think we maybe build one or two uh, for the initial release and then look at uh, adding them later, more later. And I put this slide here because it's really important to me that we make this game accessible. And I don't know if it means that we implement everything, but it's important that when I'm designing the game or I bring other people into the game uh, to help design it, that we're considering all of these different options. And these, you know, these are the ones that we're considering currently. But if there's more, it just means I haven't thought of it. So I'm happy to hear of other things that uh, have issues, whether it's hearing. You know, these are just a couple of different examples of a a bigger list of different things of how we're addressing hearing accessibility. Whether it's make sure that dialogue is captioned, that there's not audio only cues, that there's some visual aspect as well. Um, Make sure that we are using the localization systems in Unreal Engine to make sure that we can add other language support down the road. I don't know how I'm going to add, like where I'm going to source the um, the translations from, but um, if we have this built into the system, then we can maybe even post launch look at that, but continuously revisiting that to see if that's something that's viable at, the, at that point in time. Sight is important. Make sure that there's audio cues in the menu, or even if it's like turn on where there's a screen reader when you it reads the different things. I don't know how important it is, but um, and I don't really have experience with you know playing alongside someone with poor vision or issues with that how they play a game, Um, and whether a screen reader is going to help with every different option. It'd be interesting to see where that comes from. I'd like to add the open dyslexia font option. So for people that have dyslexia, open dyslexia is a great open source font for helping people. Why not just build that into the game? That's super simple. Cognitive difficult uh, accessibility is really important where it's, when I say difficulty senti- settings here, it is an MMO and you're playing in a world with other people. So I, I don't know about giving you, un- allowing players that don't have cognitive issues, but uh, to be able to one-up people by turning down the difficulty settings. That's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for people that want the questing to be better, where maybe the hard setting doesn't have exclamation points on every NPC on where you fetch your quest from, but the easy setting really holds your hand on how to find quests and progress through the quest. 
Your quest log might be filled with all the different things that you have to do now and in the future on the easy mode, but the hard modes, it's really only the stuff that you heard from, uh, and very hard would mean you have to take your own notes. Um, who knows? But difficulty settings would be uh, great for there. I want to make sure we're avoiding taunting, like from the from the game the game itself. NPCs aren't taunting players, or we have the option to disable taunting players, um, or just include it in harder harder difficulty modes. And while this is an MMO, and a lot of MMO maximalists will be like, well, if you're not here to play with people, or you have social anxiety, or other types of social disabilities, why are you playing this game? Well, the whole point of the game is to give them the ability to feel the magic, uh, and there's no reason that we shouldn't be able to let them hide or mute the, the chat. There's no reason not to. It's not a core part of the game, and if they don't want it, turn it off. Um, be able to even hide other players in the game. Maybe they exist there, but they're just not visible to the player's client. Um, and that's just allowing you people that maybe have autism or something along those lines to be able to f not have so much noise happening all at the same time. They still want a social experience, but a, a filtered down one. And maybe private servers help out with that, but I don't see why we shouldn't consider adding that option to begin with. So those are the main systems in Rockland, and I just want to talk a little bit about like, what's the theme like? What's the story like? Because we talked about, like, mechanics and things, but we haven't really talked about uh, how the how the game progresses. And we talked about set in the near future, about 50 years from now. It's on Earth, so it's from... It uses current Earth story, uh, you know, hit, events of history. We might change one thing here or there, but it would like to be a... Um, a realistic, plausible future from today's events. And the initial content will probably not have much fantasy components because we're trying to create that immersion, this very uh, down-to-earth, plausible future. I don't think that in 50 years, dragons are, are just all of a sudden going to be visible. You know, Harry Potter's like, oh, great, there's dragons and they're hidden and there's magical things to make them so they're not there. Um... That's great and all, but what about the other magical animals? I, you know, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense logically, and so we're trying to not have them, at least in the initial content, have some interesting ideas about how we can uh, get to those fantasy components, but those would be in a later sequel or something like that if we ever get there, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, but you won't have many orcs or elves or things like that. Uh, it, it's basically... The more the only fantasy components really just the magic. Apparel will be mostly casual, but we're thinking casual set in the future for 50 years. It won't be your t-shirt and jeans today. It might look something resembling of that. I, I don't know what that exactly looks like, and we're going through some concept art step uh um steps currently to figure out where that might settle on. But it'd be nice to be able to have customization options. Your character will be customizable uh, in more than just apparel, but also body type, hairstyle, uh, different things like that. Uh, we want people to not be gender restricted or other types of things to be able to allow players to build the character that they want to build. While also not breaking the immersion um, for other players in terms of I don't think I want um, someone in a Nancat suit bunny hopping through the main uh, courtyard. Maybe if it's like Halloween, that's an acceptable behavior, but I think that could break some immersion for others. And maybe that's well encouraged. I don't know what that looks like, and I think that's going to have to require some player feedback. Rockland Institute's going to be more like a research facility rather than a magical castle. I don't know why, if you had magic, you're going to keep this, like, cold, dark, musty, damp castle that's where you're going to live when you have the ability to, like, do construction with magic and you could even get fake money and all these other things. So Rockland Institute's more about finding why magic exists and it's more of a research facility. Your potions class, lab, 
is going to be more of a chemistry lab than it is this dungeon corridor. There will be cauldrons, but they will be rare elements and not necessarily your everyday brewing uh, device. You'll probably use beakers, flasks, and uh, Bunsen burners and things like that instead. Uh, Rockland Institute will be this like nature heavy haven. There will be so it will be less less fantastical in the other areas of the world uh, to kind of not create a totally dystopian future, but kind of starting to get that way. Um, and that really comes into play of the story. So in 50 years, there's a group called the Elitists, and they are have been using magic for a millennia, and they're now using it to cause global conflict. And... It's well known throughout the world that this is happening and that magic exists, but it was secret up until this point. And the Rockland Institute has been studying magic for, I think, about 100 years at that point. And um, they knew about the elitists, but it was just kind of status quo. And because of all of this, they're now inviting people to come study at Rockland Institute, and you kind of get your letter to come study at Rockland Institute and um, focus on um, learning magic. Without getting into the details of everything, conflict ensues. You learn about the different reasons of what faction is doing what, why are they doing it, what's good, what's bad about each faction. There isn't really strong good versus evil, but you learn through these your different quests. And you travel across the globe to these those different biomes, uh, to uh, these things called arcane epicenters, which are strong centers of magic uh, to retrieve different relics or knowledge or spells, potions, etc., and to either help Brooklyn Institute or help the elitists, depending on the faction you're aligned to. Throughout the entire story, you'll be able to align to different factions. Your guild will be able to align to different factions uh, and provide different types of gameplay, different opportunities. And it won't be this, like, you switch and now you're done. There will be options for you even to go back to Rockland after you discover different things and how you want to play the game. The main storyline will end in a magic, epic magic battle. And I think this might be PvP. It might be PvE. Uh, it might be a mix. I don't know. It'd be kind of cool to have a server-wide event over a few months where you can take place in these instanced arena uh you know, red versus blue, elitist versus Rockland battles, uh, and those battles can have some sort of end where one team beats the other, and over the collective of these three, this three-month event or whatever it is, uh, that can maybe help shape the story going forward for for sequels and expansions down the road. Um, throughout, we're not going to just throw you with this epic magic battle at the very end. There will be PvP throughout the thing. So as you go on these quests to these different arcane epicenters, your other faction is also going there at the same time. And they're either after the same relic or whatever, or they're after something different because their agenda is different. And throughout those things, you will have increasingly difficult, increasingly larger, different uh, confrontations with the other faction, depending on your faction that you're with. And, um, and that's just going to help you... Uh, build that battling experience throughout uh, into the end. I don't know if that's PvP. I don't know how we work that in to the story like that, uh, but uh, definitely some PvE there. Uh, for those that don't know, PvP is player versus player. PvE is player versus environment. So here are some examples of the different art style. Um, you, the top left is the lake. Um, just outside of Rockland Institute. Rockland Institute's just past the ridge. Spoiler alert, it hasn't been made, which is why you haven't seen it yet. Um, but the other pictures for the next few slides are asset packs that we have purchased. They're screenshots from the marketplace, and we're using these as uh, the starting points of building the different worlds, the different environments within the game. We're really looking for this stylized look that has a soft feel, somewhat realistic. It has substance, but there's still some sharp edges. But we're not getting to the low poly area yet. 
and it pro provides this a little bit of immersion without having to have very cartoonistic, but still not too realistic to the point where it's cost prohibitive for me to find an artist to make realistic assets, props, and things like characters that blend in with the world. So I'm just still trying to make sure that we can provide the rest of the stuff while still matching an art style that's realistic from a cost perspective. Rockland's music will be mainly orchestral. Um, we really won't play anything for you today. Um, I'm not sure if this is custom music. We have some purchased assets, but they were kind of cheap. But I think it'd be kind of cool to have some purchased music. I don't know how expensive that... I mean, I know how much it costs, but I don't know how much music we'll need. So that's the question. Um, but really want to have this uh, more cinematic experience, but not cinematic. It's an interactive experience, but more epic and adventurous. And lastly, uh, is the business model. So money is kind of a taboo when it comes to gaming. And I kind of think it's a taboo from my experience, my little experience in the indie world. Uh, even indies don't share these details very often, or even their plans for it. And I, I don't think we should shy away from it. If we talk about it, then we can understand each people's perspective and figure out what makes sense for both the business and for the player. And so I, I did at first say, you know, we want this free to cheap based content. I want players to be able to join the, um, to join playing on public servers at a very low cost. And that's going to build a better social experience for everyone and more rich gameplay. And cheap might mean $5, it might mean $10, and but I still don't want to be like, oh, you pay $5 or you pay nothing and there's 20 hours of gameplay and you're done. I would like to make sure that there's replayability and um, some extra stuff for the base content for the, that free or cheap entry point. I'm not sure where that line is drawn. I, I'm really not sure, but we'll we'll try to make sure that we're balancing both sides uh, of the of the scale there. Private servers, um, we talked about where people can have private servers. You can download those to run on your own machine. That would be like a fixed price, one-time fee, It'd be like purchasing the game in a sense. Uh, and that would be a license for up to so many simultaneous players. And you can upgrade that down the road. If you start with five players and then you just, oh, my group got bigger, I want 20 players now uh, or whatnot. And then there might be a subscription model as well. Uh, in addition to that, you know, maybe you, you get disc discounted price for the one-time fee, and then you pay a, subscrip a monthly subscription for uh, Encanted Games to host those servers on a dedicated server, so you don't have to run them on your own machine. But we want to make sure you have the option to do both. And you'd be able to run those servers on your Windows, Mac, or Linux machines. The extra content... Uh, that we make alongside, you know, post-release. I would like to be able to make sure that some of that extra content is still part of the base content. So people that are playing this game in five years, I mean, let's hope that the game is still alive in five years. But even if it's not, I want people to be able to, um, that join later on, are still getting some benefit from that extra content. So they're not having this really stale old technologically old stuff, uh, but still uh, incentivize other people to purchase this extra content, whether that's a one-time purchase for your private server, and then everyone on the private server gets to enjoy it for that one purchase, or you pay that one-time purchase um, and you get to access on the public servers. I'm not sure what that really looks like exactly. I don't have prices here, uh, but the different ways uh, that we can try to earn money to sustain the business, grow the business, in terms of making the game better. Cosmetic packs, but they would be for items that are already earned or discovered in game. You know, you've got this really magical element that you can put on your wand, but you would like it to look differently. Uh, well, you can't purchase that cosmic cosmetic item until after you have um, earned that item, that component in game. Um, Let's say you get a, a powerful staff and you want it to have green vines that glow in the dark. 
I, you know, we could sell that, and uh, but you only can purchase it after you found that stuff to begin with. And this is try to prevent p uh, pay to win, um, and and just kind of give you um, more just aesthetic options there. I think guilds are some options for for monetization. I don't know which parts are specifically monetized. I think maybe we monetize larger guilds. You know the guys that are like over a hundred players uh and that could be on for starting the guild it could be for purchasing like purchase purchasing the plot of land it could be for uh cosmetic packs so that you can theme the outside or inside of your guild hall um i'm not sure exactly what that looks like um but i do think that there's some options there while still not make still allowing people uh that kind of have the guild of five people or ten people or whatever uh, to be able to um, do that cheaply or free. Down the road, we are going to have this mod developer kit. That's the plan, at least. It'd be kind of cool to have a marketplace for mods. Um, I'm not sure if we're doing this yet, even if we do have mods. But this would just be to increase the visibility and discoverability of mods. We're A handful of us are indie devs here, and I think that we all know how hard it is to make a game, put a lot of time, effort into it, and then not be discovered. That's just, it's not that your game isn't good, it's just that you can't reach your players. And so it'd be great to be able to have a place for players to find mods, whether those are free mods, where the, the modder decides the price, um, or or they're paid, um, and then we would maybe just, uh, just take a percentage cut, you know, no, no more than 12% uh, to try to stay within like the new paradigm of where people are charging for things. Um, so $0 uh, mod would be a $0 to Encanto. Not sure what that really is looking like. I saw in the release notes somewhere under the Epic Games launchers, Epic might be releasing their own moddable marketplace inside the store. So maybe you don't build it. All right, so I wanted to thank you all for attending and taking the time to hear about Rockland. Uh, if you want to follow development, uh, the Twitter is here, and I will put it in the chat. And then from there, there's a link to the Discord, which I could probably also invite you there. Uh, and... Um, I will go through these questions uh, one by one, and then I'm also looking for feedback of any of the different uh, different aspects of the game. So let's see. Uh, go ahead. Oh, do you have all the lore ready written down somewhere? Uh, that's a great question, Jesse. And we don't have it all written down, but we have uh, bits and pieces being written. We're trying to build a, uh, I I've, have a wiki for easy editing. I've gone through a different, different uh, systems to try to make sure that we are providing a easy system for me to like, oh, got this idea, I'll jot it down real quick. Um, it's not all there. There's still a lot, a lot to be written. Uh, next question. Spellcasting seems to be kind of like the skate games. Uh, it's not on my radar, but I will definitely check them out. Uh, thanks for the reference. Uh, next question is, this seems like very complex games. Oh, and Nick, I think, uh, we could also maybe open the audio if there's like follow-up for these questions as well. Sure. Yeah, I can do that now if you're comfortable with it. That'd be great. All right. Yeah, just keep going and all. I don't want to just be plowing through them and then there's like uh, contextual uh, follow ups to those questions. All right, just give me a moment and I'll unlock those permissions for people. Sure. Yeah. I'll go with the next question. In the meantime, it seems like a very complex game with a lot of different systems. What's the size of your team working on it? That's a great question. Uh, the size is one, me, uh, full time. And I have a couple of other volunteers helping me out. We're trying to build, uh, I say we a lot because I try to get used to saying we, so eventually there will be a team, hopefully, if there's funding for it. I'm trying to build a lot of the prototypes and uh, get to a vertical slice and try to find funding, whether that's through publishing or through 
um, through like a mega grant or something like that through Epic. And from there, try to build the team slowly. Start with a lead art, like a general artist that's going to help uh, build different things uh, from an art perspective. And then maybe a developer and then growing from there. I don't know what that really looks like. Um, not everything in the game will that I've presented here today might not even end up in the game. Uh, I have a lot of experience with really scoping my projects really large, uh, but I've also have experience with scope uh, cutting scope later down the road. So I, I'm kind of just building things as we as as I can and prioritizing accordingly. And um, if it seems infeasible and time is running out, then things will get cut. Um, but trying to get to a vertical slice and then. Uh, iteratively in an agile perspective, trying to push that uh, vertical slice forward to some sort of launch. Nick, did, did that get enabled? Yeah, so uh, folks, if you if you hear Mike answering your question now uh, and you want to give follow up or provide more context after his answer, uh, you feel free to do that now. I've you should you should be able to speak. Perfect. Thanks. Mm-hmm. Next question from uh, Dave or David. Um, are we going to see the standard tank slash healer DPS roles for group play or something else? I think that I don't know if I want to have classes for it, but I want to provide different spells for people to specialize in those areas and they can organically just form themselves where people can get better at those different spells and therefore be more effective at it and they specialize in them i don't know if i necessarily want to create like you choose this a tank class for example and now you're limited for that perspective but that there are tank related like spells that people can then specialize in and uh focus on that that perspective I'm not sure that's going to work out um, because it's not really uh, normal for an MMO. What is the overall? And please, if uh, interrupt me uh, if there's any follow up. I'll try to leave space in between. Can someone help us out and just make sure that we did unmute everybody if they have the option to? Yeah, I'll test it. Check, Perfect. Check. That working? Cool. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks, Perfect. guys. Yeah. Thank you. Excellent. Um, what is the overall struggle slash goals, both from a player progression and lore standpoint? Well, that's a great question. Uh, oh. Um, So the overall struggle is related to the battle between Rockland Institute and the elitists uh, that we did cover probably after you asked that question. Um, I think that the struggle is about this constantly shifting, at least in the public MMO server perspective. I'm not sure how it applies in the private perspective, but it's about overcoming the other group in terms of... Um, ending the reign of the elitists and the control that they're having or uh, finding out whether the faults in Rockland Institute and are they doing everything um, by the book? Um, maybe they're portraying the elitists as someone that's evil, but necessarily aren't that bad. Um, so you kind of see these, the players as, as adults more so than, you know, mostly children with adults. Yeah, I think the the, the main player character is going to be closer to an adult than, than a player. I, I don't think we're thinking Harry Potter 11 to 17 age, but more uh, middle-aged adults. Did I answer your question? Yep. Cool. Since spells slash potions might be something that takes more time, is there going to be another combat option that happens faster, like melee traps uh, or guns and explosives? I haven't thought about it, and I think that there are a lot of options. I'm not sure about melee. Um, I want to. The pro 
melee gets difficult in a magic focused game because then you have I guess what I'm trying to prevent is I'm trying to prevent this system where there's 50 people within five feet of this monster, for example, all attacking this thing when from a magic perspective, you have incentive to get farther away because it's harder for the opponent to hit you. Uh, But you also want to be close enough for you to be able to aim and hit the opponent. So there is more range there. So I'm not sure about melee. Um, I think that there could be some some further content that adds melee. But traps, guns, explosives could be really interesting. Uh, guns kind of get implemented through spells uh, as this uh, the thing is travel through, and I can show that. Um, we'll go ahead and start this so that it takes a second. Um, we could have different spells that um, they travel faster um, and have more of a, a gun-like perspective. Or maybe there's a spell that has a burst or something like that. Uh, so I think there are definitely options for that. Explosives and traps would be really interesting. Um, I think the answer is yes, I just don't know the the, the specifics. Uh, PvP. I, we did talk about PvP. Did I answer your questions for PvP? Yeah, for the most part, I think so. I, any, I think any follow-up questions you, on that? No, no. I think as you form, as you form that like basic player progression experience, you're gonna, you know, you're gonna organically make that decision about players to be able to attack each other if there are yeah. conditions upon which they can do that. Maybe there's like a dual system, you know, like where it's just right. one, one kind of friendly competition thing. Or it could be, let's attack that other player's guild and let's all mass up. <laughs> right. Um, I I, I want to yeah I want to create a I mean there'll probably be some PVE only servers. I eventually one day um, the main server will have PVP and we'll probably like you said grow that as one players progress as the game progresses and as we get feedback from different players of wanting different types of play. Um, and, and trying to make sure that there's engaging play that's repeatable. I do think that one of the lessons that I think Blizzard learned with World of Warcraft is they kind of, quote-unquote, threw PvP in sort of at the end. It wasn't something yeah. that they thought about a whole lot when they were creating the systems. And the problems that they had with that lasted for years. I mean... To some degree, some people would tell you they still have to switch it, but they have, they have like found a good balance. But it took them a long time because they didn't plan in the beginning. I think it might be useful for you to, you know, put a stake in the ground and say, if we're going to have some form of it, even if it's a very limited, controlled form, so that you can, because balancing spells and and damages and things like that, ranges and stuff, is a lot different. When it comes to other players that are as opposed to ai you know yeah yeah i i definitely agree and appreciate it and i will um like i had some initial thoughts but i'll definitely make sure that i spend the time to uh pl- plan a more and because it, it really comes down to it that's with with any system you build a game and it's going to work and then you don't want to touch existing systems because it might break things uh you know and it's also expensive to you know, add things later, so it ends up being patchwork, and it doesn't really play in. So, I appreciate it. Uh, how do you tend to draw in the Harry Potter crowd? Oh, draw in the Harry Potter cloud crowd if you remove the setting. Uh, Jesse, what setting do you? Oh, like the like you're not in the Harry Potter castle. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Um, you said the Magic Universe was IRL in 50 years uh, and no medieval setting. That's correct. Uh, I think there will be some medieval, like, uh, rune, like castle runes and ruins, not runes, uh, and things like that. But I think the question about Harry Potter crowd is going to be tricky. Um, I think it's going to require a specific marketing budget. To some degree, I, I don't know if it would be anywhere close to what a 
a normal, even like double A studio would spend. Um, and I think it's going to come down to either Hogwarts Legacy uh, fails dramatically and they want to find another game. And Hogwarts Legacy is slated for release in 2022 and um, mine would be uh, maybe maybe an early access in mid to late 2022 earliest and then um, and then maybe full release sometime in 2023. So there might be some of that. It might be people play the game. Hogwarts Legacy is a single player game and they consume it and it's done. There's no expansions, etc. And they're looking for more. And uh, if I can somehow get this in front of their face, uh, then that helps. Um, and we'll see from there. Also, a lot of people are looking for multiplayer for Hogwarts Legacy. So I'm assuming there's this Harry Potter gamer crowd that's gravitating to this already existing game, which actually kind of helps me in a sense, because I'm finding out what the addressable market is from a casual perspective. Um, and figuring out what they don't address and what I can address to kind of differentiate myself in the market and bring them in. I think it's, and I will clarify, stop. And then uh, on top of that, I have post, you know, back about a year ago, I posted on our Harry Potter Reddit, uh, worked with the mods to get a post there for my survey, for my different game. And I reached out for these Harry Potter uh, fans, not necessarily gamers, they would even be interested in a non-Harry Potter themed world. And more than half of them said yes. I, I don't have the percentage up. So I think they're interested. It's just about making sure I market in front of them. Uh, at the time, the mods said they'd be welcome for me to post again if I reached out to them. So um, if I have some good looking trailers and things like that, I can reach a large market. It's a really interesting question that has a lot of dynamics that I don't know necessarily answers to yet. Next question. How would you reconcile major story events being PvP while still having the option for of private personal service that people can run for just their friends? Group of six may not want to fight each other, but still want the full story experience. That's a great question. Um... I don't know if I have the answer for that right now, um, Fox. Um, I will have to think about that more. Um, it's a really important question, and I need to make sure I plan accordingly. I think that um, we'll at least have the group of six may have like arena duels, like they're sparring, so they can have still some PvP experience. If they purchase the private server, they can all always go to the public server to try to experience that. I don't know if their character like translates from private to public. Um, but I think from in their private server, they would need to have some sort of way to spar, whether it's duels or like a 3v3 kind of option for that. Or we just make sure that the PvE has the player versus environment where the battles in the game itself would have increasingly difficulty depending on the setting that you set and try to make sure to give you an engaging experience. You'll still have the full story. Like I think that the story you get in the MMO is still going to be very similar to the one in the private server. And I've kind of touched base on it. It would be very difficult for me to plan a story that changed for an entire server based off of some event that happened because of the players like the players changed the story that happened it'd be difficult for me to plan that content to make that content uh it just gets operationally expensive to do it all and so it ends up being depending on your choices you have new options and so like it might look like you have a choice and then you end up your choice doesn't matter <laughs> which kind of sucks because it sounds like every other game and people complain about it but to try to say that your choice did have some impact and you have a new quest, a new storyline, a new, not storyline, but a new set of options that progress forward, whether that's changing factions or if it's there's this rare item that you can now get because you made that choice to try to still make choice matter, but to also not actually like 
have untold story changes to the game. Did that answer your question? I, I, this is just, a, a, I think, a difficult one to answer, and I have to think more about it. Yeah, let's go. Cool. Uh, how do you intend to support the game and work on new updates at the same time with a small team? Responding to password resets, player disputes, bug reports, fixes, typical MMO tech support, etc. I, I don't, I don't have that answer, um, Jesse. That is uh, an important one to think about, and um, it might be hiring uh, someone to help out with that uh, as we get closer. Maybe it's a part-time person, and we just don't have like twenty-four hour, twenty-four-seven support kind of deal. Um, or I work crazy hours, but that's probably not the solution because I'll probably work crazy hours to just do the game. Um, so I don't know. Uh, I think that's something where I'm going to have to figure out as we get closer to, 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 to launching. But uh, thanks for bringing it up. I wasn't thinking about that. Oh, more questions. I was like, oh, I hit, hit my when I put the Twitter link, and then I scrolled down. Uh, next question. Are brooms for fast travel, combat, or both? Okay, that's a great question. Haven't The first answer is fast travel. I don't think it's the only fast travel uh, option. I think there's going to be another instantaneous fast travel, like in Harry Potter, there's Apparition or the Flu Network or something like that. Um, but I, I, it will be for fast travel. And for you to explore areas outside of the main. So there's these different biomes and think of those biomes as cities. And there are distant suburbs where there might be some secrets uh, and it's really impossible for you to f walk through it all and find it. But on a broom, you could go find those different areas. Um, I think that combat ends up being interesting i've thought about how you might be able to cast spells on a broom and i don't know if i can really figure that one out until i have some sort of broom mechanic in um the answer is i want it to be both and i also want it to be for for mini games whether that's a sport like a, a sports ball sport like quidditch uh, but not quidditch or if it's racing or something like that um, but also for, for in-game, mini-games. Any follow-up on that, Radio Fist? No, no perfect. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Uh, regarding casting, everything has to have a cost for it to feel meaningful. Consider something like Clash Royale, where you are building energy when in combat. Maybe a different pool from a different combat energy. And have to hand and have a hand of cards, like a spell book, runes, crystals, from a small deck. Cards cost energy, and when used, the energy goes down, and the card is randomly replaced. It would be interesting to seeing that in real-time MMO combat scenario. Uh, that's, that's, a great, um, that's a great idea. I, would be, I don't know if it would be for everything. Uh, like, if let's you had... It would be like a replacement of mana, which would be like these crystals that get consumed as you as you cast spells. Um, maybe specific spells are need some sort of consumable to to work and things like that. Um, and I, I could see that being really interesting. I'm not sure if uh, there was a follow up on that. Yeah, no, I just I was just spitballing. Honestly, okay. I mean, when you yeah. when you put out that you don't want to have mana or cooldowns you know that's a that's a significant challenge like is it just that you don't want that to be different or is it that you don't like those systems anymore and you want something fresh i think i want something fresh that's different um i i and something fresh ends up like because so like a consumable is a form of mana um, and it would look just like mana, but you have to go fetch things instead of having it regenerate, which yeah, might be more frustrating than of, mana. In the context of that idea, it's like, basically, you, you cre it's like a deck builder, right? You create a deck of, say, I don't know, six spells or whatever you want, like eight spells, 
And those mm-hmm. are the ones that you're in combat, you're drawing from, but you only see like three of them at any time that you can pick from. So there's a little bit of randomness there, a little bit of deck build, you know, construction of your kind of spell book or whatever. And then, you know, you might go, oh, you know, I, I, uh, I realized I'd rather have fireball than ice blast or something. And then out mm-hmm. of combat, you might, or you might know that you're going to face a certain kind of creature, certain obstacle that you need to focus your spells on. And then it's sort of that kind of thing. So it is, it is consumable, but replenishes itself in that context. I don't know. We can talk mm-hmm. about it deeper later if you want. I'm, I'm definitely willing to help you out with the design for this stuff. Yeah, definitely. I'll let, I'll think about it and and then reach out. Um, I, I, I definitely love to have a sidebar about that. Regarding alchemy, I'd love to see. I'd love to share an idea I had to come from a dream potionist. Uh, great. Well, I mean, you. Do we have the time to talk about it now? We can we can sidebar it unless it's quick. Later. Yeah. It's it's. Uh, I have like a little write up that I had of the dream after I oh, had perfect. it. Perfect. But it, it it presented itself with this entire thing that I was like, oh, that could kind of dovetail with uh, Mike's idea here because oh, that- I love the idea and I want to do something with it, whether it's a book or a game. But I don't know. Cool. I'll I'll, uh, I'll send you the little write up that I made for it, and then you can just kind of see how that tastes. Awesome, appreciate it. Uh, once you dive into your game pl- uh, gameplay mechanics and systems, feel free to hit me up. Sounds great. Would love to do it. Uh, on spellcasting, uh, make patterns unique to a given character. Uh, solves the spells. I was really thinking of this. Some sort of like, pers- maybe maybe not like the ma- the majority of spells have a common pattern, but then some of these like more difficult spells or the um, um. Or like the really rare ones that you can discover by just like playing around with the pattern thing uh, would be some sort of procedurally generated. And the system is built in a way that would support procedural generation. Uh, the question would just be is like what what would come out of the procedural generator might be really weird. Um, yeah, I was I was thinking kind of that that same idea, right? Like you you know you could start off with a, a like a base for the more complicated spells. So you might say, well, this one requires four gestures of some kind and mm-hmm. then you know have like a, a hash function that you apply for each character so that each character start basically starts off with the same base for that spell but then transmutes it into a different thing for them right and right. then that way you know everybody has the same complexity for the more difficult spells but they can't share them uh just by right. telling you how to do it <laughs> yeah i think i think there's some really interesting um there's something there i don't know what it is uh, specifically, but um, I really want to do it. Thanks. Yeah. yeah, no problem. Over the shoulder makes it hard to connect with your connector c- character. Maybe camera switch modes, depending on movement act actively casting. That's that's really great. Um, I kind of really want to give like Skyrim has a mixed third person versus first person kind of view, where when you go in a dungeon, you end up. I th- yeah. I th- I think it's when you go in a dungeon, you become first person, or you can always change. I can't remember. Yeah, it's just you. Ago. You could just swap it. It's it's a button yeah. press and scroll wheel. Like um, I've 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 implemented uh oh, you know, you can get further or closer, and so there would probably be one more scroll level past this point, which would be first person. Um, and I think that's pretty easy to add in terms of development yeah. wise. One thing, a a good example of this, I've been playing the Nier series of games a lot, and they do a lot of, like, camera trickery to kind of help you connect with your character and their place in the the world that you're in. So, like, they'll they'll place your camera in different locations depending on what would make it a more interesting view, (laughs) which might be, you know, excessive with an MMO, I would say. It'd be a ton of work to have specific camera placements for everything, but, like, if, if your character can never move transversely to the camera you rarely end up looking at their face <laughs> right that's always the risk with even in skyrim and i think <laughs> i think skyrim kind of gets away with it because the, the whole elder scroll series has always been about your character being just a complete blank slate that you don't really right. 
connect with. But it seems like you're not going for that. Like you want your character to be role played, and I don't think the Elder Scrolls has ever really been about role playing as much as as um you're you're the <laughs> the chosen one or the nameless or whatever they they want to go with. <laughs> so if you could yeah, like no, I always encourage the, the player to see the the whole character, that helps a lot with making them you know a part of the the world. I completely agree. Um, if you could uh, put in the chat um, the name of that game so oh, yeah, I can definitely. reference it later, that'd be great. Yeah. Thanks. On monetization, private servers, profit center for studio, uh, maybe charge overhead on a serverless, have a free tier for intermittent private servers and a subscription model for 24-7. Yeah, uh, so I think that the private servers are to me, I think private servers is where the main monetization comes from. It's like purchasing a copy of the game. You can have a free client, and the server itself is where uh, the costs uh, get incurred. And for people that are on the public servers, there's other ways to to monetize that. Uh, but for the private servers, I have a feeling a lot of people, since it's moddable and mods start coming out, and you want to play this mod, or you only want to play your friend with your friends because there's just too much going in the public server. You go and you spend the, you know, whatever it is um, for people. And so it'd probably be like a one-time cost for like self-hosting. And and then um, I, I didn't think about intermittent private servers, but I don't see any reason why we couldn't. Um, it's more infrastructure, but um, it's definitely feasible very possible yeah i mean I'll, I'll put it out i think that you're unlikely to get a lot of people who will pay for for a one-time cost to self-host but you could make a significant amount of your your steady income from selling you know private servers to people which like other right. games other platforms they do that via a third party all the time <laughs> like they make the 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 server, um, you know, software, and then they make it freely available. And then some other company comes in and starts selling like Counter-Strike was a big, you know, uh, bastion of this model before. <laughs> or you would like, right. you'd pay somebody to, to host your, your Counter-Strike clan uh, private server so you can practice, you know, alone. <laughs> but that's, that should be you in this case. Like if you, you know, have the, the ability to um, provide some basic back end and you could do it pretty easily on any of the big platforms right now. And, you know, something containerless would be a good fit for it. You can basically yep. make sure that, that you're selling time on it. And if it's intermittent, then um, you can, you can have like a free tier. Like you could say, well, you can get a private server that you don't use constantly because it doesn't cost sure. you anything. Right. <laughs> no, that, and then if they do idea. charge them money. <laughs> Yeah, I think the self-hosting is going to be for the few that want it. And I think it also is kind of a, you purchase the self-hosting and you realize it's problematic because you have to have it running all the time and people don't do that usually. And and then provide some sort of discounted to go to um, company hosted. Yeah. The uh, other so it's kind of an onboarding to self-hosting. Is that they're going to buy it and expect support from you? <laughs> to be able that to that is the best yeah so <laughs> which is nerve wracking <laughs> i think it's probably you know i'd be fine if it was something where we try it out in early access and if there's enough people that want to play the game and see where that goes and um if it's possible that way it doesn't really add a lot of more um time or energy for me to build stuff for other machines other than Linux, um, like build the servers for Windows and Mac. Um, sure. But cool. Um, let's see. If you have uh, these two large major factions, the players can pick either side. How do you stop power snowballing on one side? As most people would pick the side that gives them a better chance to win. That's a great question. Um, And I, th my initial thoughts on it were that I would hope that people would want to be part of the exclusive. Not everyone wants to do the snowballing. Some people want to be the underdog, and they want to fight against the big powerful thing. And if you provide other opportunities and quests, people might feel like they're missing out 
uh, if they were not part of the other faction, these quests that they can't have uh, without being part of it. And I don't, you know, you might be able to roll a new character and choose a different faction later down the road. Um, but I think with people that are looking for um, game balance, then there might be some opportunities to switch. Maybe we incentify them for not just more than quests. Maybe it's items or uh, in-game currency or something like that. In terms of, like, there's loot available that's not being picked up, and that incentivizes people to self-balance. I, I don't know what it really looks like, and I think we're going to have to um, spend some more time thinking about that. Any follow-up on that, Fox? Um, yeah, I think it's got to be something in there because, like, as you said, people will, some people will go for an underdog, but, like, there's a very real chance that it'll end up being 80% of people on one faction, and right. a lot of new players will be like, oh, that's clearly the better faction, so I'll go with them. Yeah. Um. I just think it should be kept it, in mind, you know? Yeah, totally. Uh, thanks for bringing it up. I, I wasn't thinking about it too much really appreciate it. I'll, I'll add that to my docs make sure we're continuously to think how that how we can deal with it death slash resurrection in lore helps a lot with immersion uh near automata androids bring themselves up planescape tor torment player is undead and wakes up in morgue yeah, like to clarify, like like making yeah. it so that when your character dies and comes back to life, which is going to happen all the time, right? That it has like a meaning in in the story versus just oh. the, the the easy like, oh, you're at a checkpoint or you hit a save game or whatever. Right. Yeah, I I'll keep it in mind. I haven't honestly haven't thought about it yet. Yeah. Uh, is this a top down game, first person, third person? Yeah, third person, and we discussed just earlier about maybe uh, making it first person. Any follow up on that, Micah? Yeah, I got, I got it. Cool. cool. Uh, oh, well, I could read the following stuff because Nick answered your question. Uh, Jesse, how do you plan to handle death respawn system? Drop slash loot. Uh, yeah. I think we uh, we don't know the answer to that. I don't know if... It, so there was the respawning part that we just talked about with Mirady Fist, but then there's the other thing, which was like, do you drop loot and... Uh, or or not just loot, but inventory. Um, and what does that look like? Um, I don't know the answers to that. Um, and also, I don't know the answer to Kid Friendly. I don't... I think that the game is probably going to end up being like a PG-13 plus. Um, I, I don't I think that uh, when you have fantasy death and violence, I think it's hard to get E. Um, and so I, I guess I don't know the answers to that, those questions yet. But thanks for bringing them up. If this isn't set in the future, why don't they just use like a big machine gun or something in a straight fight? Would why would you choose magic? Uh, I, I, I that's a great <laughs> great question. Why not have like a an RPG and just blow everyone up? Um, I I don't. Other than like, oh, you could have a magical shield that blocks physical things, but not magical things, um, and after you get to an intermediate level, that's like just a constant buff that's easy to do. And that could explain it. Maybe I, I don't know <laughs> without thinking oh, about it oh, more. And some design. sort of magic that like deflects metal objects. So bullets would right. never hurt you or. Yeah. But then you also, Oh, so metal would, yeah, that, that would maybe work so that bullets wouldn't, but, uh, but still have the ability for like, monsters in the uh to still have melee damage um i don't know i don't i don't have the answer to that it's a great question and i will have to think about it if you have ideas uh i'd love to hear them you could do something in lore like uh maybe make it so that metal working is no longer 
uh, as easy to do <laughs> is in the modern world. Like something happened uh, and it became back to medieval style um, metalworking concepts where it was, a, you know, a lot of work to produce something out of metal. So you wouldn't be able to make machine guns or anything that depends on fine machining. It's a good idea. Mm, yeah, I had some I had thoughts along a similar line of thinking, like, just maybe make it in. in, in Maybe, maybe lore-wise, there can just be some sort of uh, reason why the motivation... If, if there's a motivation for using magic over traditional weapons, then I think you'll be fine. Like, So if you could just create some sort of reason, whether it's that, whether it's an industrial reason, like, you know, means to pr production are, are less accessible, or maybe the, the there's maybe magic just has higher incentive. Maybe it, maybe it, it requires less resources to be... A, to be uh, a, a proficient magic user than it does to be a gun user or something like that. So it just over time, people just you know uh, move or become more interested in magic or whatever, and guns kind of fall to the wayside or something like that. I don't know. Oh yeah. man! And like everyone knows how to fly on a broom, so they don't build cars anymore. So then all the industries that were building like car parts like shut down. <laughs> there you go. There's a real world He's example in the you know the um, Apollo program. We don't know th how to produce a lot of those things anymore because we've just moved on to different different concepts. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's a high tech environment that just kind of fell by the wayside because we changed how we we operate. A lot of great ideas. There's even sequel items here that I can uh, add follow-up stories. If I ever get to a sequel, I need to get to the first game. Um, cool. Um, the rest of it, uh, maybe the future government forbids guns, so guns are rare. I think that... The problem with that is with uh, 3D printers today can basically build guns and you can make your own bullets. So you really could, maybe it's more effort than it's worth to, so it, it's it's forbidden, but the effort is just not worth it because you could go just go learn magic. I don't, I guess I don't know, really know the answer. These are all a lot of great uh, suggestions. Um, definitely will uh, consider it more. Any other uh, questions or feedback? Anything I missed? I just wanted to say, like, if I was a publisher, it would make me very nervous that you're not sure on how to balance the game. Like, I think maybe if you had more of your mechanics written down and actually had that planned out, it'd be good. I think the... So I, ha it's, I have the mechanics balance or mechanics written. The problem comes down to um, the MMO perspective. There's a lot of unknowns, and it's not like I'm an industry veteran that came from Blizzard that understands how to balance these systems and things like that. And I'm not a huge gamer, so I don't have the experience of playing the MMOs. And while I have uh, people I consult with for that, you know, it's it ends up being difficult. Uh, I agree with you that there's a lot. I mean, there's a lot of things. I, mean, I don't think a publisher is even going to like the business model uh, unless I have like specific numbers. And those numbers are going to be like, well, I'm just I kind of think I'm going to have this conversion rate based off of my total ad addressable market. And if I had a marketing budget of fifty thousand dollars then I could really make it happen, I, I think there's a lot of unknowns. Um, and. My funding extends a while that I don't have to worry about it in the near term, like in the next six months. Um, but it starts some something I need to start worrying about um, in about a year or so um, if I can't find other ways to extend runway. Um, so TLDR is, yes, I will continue thinking about it, appreciate it, and... Um, probably can't answer it until I build a little bit more of the game and get close to a vertical slice. And have like game like play tests and seeing how it actually works uh, when people are playing together. Um, like I didn't think of the charging thing until like I was jumping around with my brother in the server and it was like, oh, well, you it's really hard. Like you can aim, but now you can no longer slow time because it's an MMO. Because before, it you would slow time while you were aiming the spell. 
And so it was easier to do it that way. But since you're an MMO or an online game, you can't slow down time. And now aiming is really difficult. So you'd have to charge. So I think there's a lot of play tests that's going to have to happen to figure out um, specifics. Yeah, you could also take some of the aiming um, fine motor requirements out of it and add some homing capabilities. I mean, a lot of spells seem like a natural fit for yeah. things that don't need perfect aim. Right. And I think there's there's also, you know, many, many games have um, aim assist built in. Um, and I think some aim assist can... So there's homing, and then there's also eight was where your targeting would be the aim assist, snapping oh, sure. targets and things like that. Um, yeah, you could have like aim assist that activates while you're drawing the pattern only. So it's not right. like true aim assist, but you, just. But you have to be close enough to be able to get that. And the person's got to be so far away or something like that. We can definitely have um, a pretty, pretty simple system to get a pretty effective result there. Anything else? I'm also interested in was the order of the slides good? Was the progression of telling you about Rockland and going through the different things was was that did that work well? Did was there areas to improve? Um, the last time I presented this, the order was completely different, and um, I could change it again um, if I ever present this kind of like stuff to someone else. I thought the slides order was good. Cool. Yeah, same here. It seemed to have a pretty good flow to it. You started with the higher level stuff, and you get and you know the later on you got into the new, the more nitty gritty stuff i think that works pretty well thanks i'm also looking for mike i i i don't see the appeal here um i don't know if people are going to play this game uh put the e brakes on i i definitely want to hear that like, don't try to uh, save my feelings here. This the whole point is to reach out, get feedback, and then hear from that, and then iterate from there. Um, you know, this is you know a considerable investment in terms of time and money, and I would like to make sure that I'm going in the right direction, which was kind of the whole point of designing a whole game design document to help me organize my thoughts, and then put it in a presentable way where I can actually share those. And then that helps me iterate on the design itself. So um, the whole point is to figure out, is this even a good direction to go down the road um, before, or do we need a pivot somewhere? Uh, you know, I'll, I, I don't want to make it sound like I'm, um, so I'll, I'll preface this by saying that I'm not a Harry Potter fan. <laughs> Sure. <laughs> just to give you some some background, it doesn't do it doesn't do anything for me, and I I can't speak to like whether or not I as a, a non Harry Potter fan would want to play a, a magic themed game. But it seems like you've got a lot of systems that really lend themselves more towards something like the Minecraft crowd. Honestly, a lot of like right. like I want to to give players the ability to construct things and and you know produce recipes and things like that. And I think. Uh, you're going to split yourself if you try to make it both a Harry Potter game and a Minecraft game. <laughs> like, if, if, you, if you do that, what you'll end up with is that, you know, diehard Harry Potter fans who love the, the books themselves and the stories will think of it as a off-brand, right? And you might eventually right. end up with, with them deciding to, to shoehorn Harry Potter licensed trademarks into your game, but that seems like a, a tough thing to, to bank on for this much time in development. Whereas you do have a whole lot of concepts that would fit well to uh, a non-Harry Potter IP, right? So I, right. I'd probably lean into that a bit more and, and spend less time trying to figure out how you can make sure that that you meet Harry Potter fan requirements, I would say. That's that's a great idea. I think when I first came up with Rockland, you know, there was no modern Harry Potter game and I was trying to fill that void and now there's Hogwarts Legacy, and maybe it's less important. And so now I'm trying to differentiate myself, and that's where I came up with all these different systems and all these other stuff. And so I think 
I guess my question would be is because I'm I don't know if I'm looking we can I can build a sandbox MMO. I'm not well, I don't even know where if this fits into sandbox or theme park one or the other black and white. Uh, but I think I guess the takeaway the question from you for you is is the design of the game with the heavy fo- magic uh, focus in magic and the, all the other systems fine. It's just from a pitch perspective trying to remove references to the Harry Potter and don't try to add systems that are specifically target for that market. Is is that the takeaway? Yeah, yeah, or? exactly. Like just you know, Perfect. make sure that you you don't end up graying the, the line between yourself and Harry Potter because then you end up. Uh, uh, splitting your audience, but I think you have an audience that probably would be interested. In this. <laughs> and right. I, I don't want to say like make a, a Minecraft with magic. Like it doesn't have to be the exact right. same thing. But you're obviously trying to build things where you have a lot of like interconnected systems and and places for people to craft and explore. And I think that's you know, that's that's your strong point here, honestly. Okay. Cool. Uh, I will. Uh, I'll take that in perspective. I'll like definitely change this slide. This is the one place where it was like really put in. But um, when I present other parts where like I talk, I referenced Harry Potter, I'll try to uh, think of better ways to award that. Appreciate it. Yeah. And t- again, take it with a grain of salt. <laughs> Part of it's that I don't know. Really yeah, like sure. Harry Potter, so. Well, no, I mean, it's true. So I'm building an MMO and a huge market is the MMO players. And um if I target Harry Potter fans, not necessarily gamers, not all of them are gamers, and I might not capture much of that market from a business perspective. So it makes sense to say, just tell the game it, how it is and let people play the game how they want. If they are Harry Potter and they're looking for another magical experience, they will find it here. If they are someone that's looking for an immersive social experience, they can find it here. If they're looking for... Uh, uh, some deep lore they can sink their teeth in, they'll find it here, but not really try to... I shouldn't preemptively box my audience. Yeah, yeah, exactly. By the way I I, I market and advertise. Yeah. I appreciate that. I thought it was really interesting that Randy Fist brought up Minecraft because that was the first place my mind went when you mentioned private servers. The idea of people being able to kind of spin up their yep. own instance of the world. I feel like that's a huge appeal of Minecraft, especially when you mentioned like, hey, I think my favorite example you gave was like a content creator wants to have their own server for their community. That seems like a really neat idea. And you, you might even want yeah. to like lean into that to, in the marketing campaign later down the line. Yeah, yeah. definitely. That's a, I'd be interested to like, how do you market that? How do, it's really more like, you go to these con i i don't know you would have to have because you're trying to address a small market that has a large effective audience but how do you reach the actual content creators and get their time it just ends up being you have to have some sort of popularity to the point where they're curious about the game and that the tools are available for them and more than anything when i design things from a business perspective like the best business is a business in which enables other people to do business. Um, and that comes with like the plugins I make for Unreal Engine. Uh, they're all free right now, but they enable other people to build their own things and make businesses. So if I can somehow make a monetization strategy that helps other people make their money, um, then uh, it'll p- pay for itself. So I'm I'm curious where where that will end up, but my yeah that that theme is uh, for at least like the private modable servers is really something I think my, Minecraft was heavy on my mind for that and it's just interesting like to compare like Minecraft's business model is everyone pays thirty bucks and then servers are free um, as long as you have a copy of the game and many mods are free as long as you have a copy of the game. And I think it's, I kind of wanted to get to this point where like someone pays the 30 bucks and their five friends can play for free. And someone can pay the $2,000 for a very large private server and all of their community members can play for free. 
they wouldn't pay the $2,000. They'd pay the $1,000 plus the $100 monthly server, server host because they don't want to deal with it. Um, but m- more or less, I think that there is um, some interesting opportunities there. Yeah, there are interesting opportunities there. For example, maybe if a, if a content creator has an audience and they say, hey, I've spun up my own server. If you guys are fans, you can play with me. They could then make that like a, a perk for subscribing to them on whatever service, like subscribe and get access right. to my, my Rockland server. Just spitballing ideas. I don't know. I, I think that's a really yeah. interesting, uh, really interesting kind of component of your game. I, th- I find it really, really fascinating. I hope so. Um, just something I was thinking. I've been thinking about. So I put together a timeline. Um, I'm thinking of putting together a very small prototype for August first. I I picked eight weeks. And um, and that would have very initial spell casting, initial uh, potion making with a couple of spells and potions like preset, like easy to do, but the system there. And not really quest, but um, be able to have like a little play test where, you know, a handful of us could all jump on a server and have like a little deathmatch or battle royale and kind of feel for how how the game feels in terms of combat. Because I think that is a major part of the game, but it's also a small part. That's where I'm starting. And then, um, oh, I have it right here. Let's see. Rocklin. Business. Yeah, spells, potions, and parties. Yeah, I'd want people in that prototype, I'd have people be able to, like, party up and make teams just to kind of build the party system and have, like, invites and joins and things. Just trying to get some initial stuff there. And then, so that's August 1st. Then we're looking January 2022 would be, like, an MVP with most of the systems implemented. Um... And we've we've done most of the re- rework uh, for those different systems. Uh, and then we start building more content. Maybe we'd have some initial content for January 2022. Then about six months for July, so about a year from now, we would have kind of like a preview where I would let people sign up and they could start playing like real early acts. Or they'd sign up and I would invite them to be part of the preview and that would have, it's like a pre-alpha or whatever, or an alpha. And then I'm spending the next year maturing stuff, adding content, doing art, marketing, figuring it all up. And August 2023 would either be a launch or a Kickstarter. I don't know, like, the Kickstarter would be like a short reward period where, like, you would purchase kind of, kind of purchasing some special content um, to get access to the game. And um, I don't know what the team size is going to look like by August 2023. That's a long time from now. Um, But uh, that would kind of give me some time between August and then my runway ends up at the end of 2023. Sans any other money coming in. And so I, I try to plan to, I don't know, it'd be nice to make some sort of passive income with my plugin work to maybe like add a half year or or add someone like a part-time contractor to help out with development, to help out with writing um, and things like that. So kind of a far-fetched dream, but a lo- long time frame. Um, I don't know where it's going with that. Other than to share, I guess. Yeah, I guess you were just sharing your timeline, which is, which is cool to hear you kind of where you're thinking in terms of how long you think it'll take to get to launch. Yeah, I'm hoping the preview would be like 100 to 600 people. No. 20 to 100 people. Uh, people. And I would have a private beta in January 2023. That would be 100 to 300, and then later scope to 300 to 600. And then the open beta would be August 2023. 
with 600 to 1,000 people, roughly, maybe, question mark. And this is assuming that I would even have 1,000 people that wanted to play the game, you know? I, I don't even know that answer yet. Um, but if I don't, then it's kind of a loss. I think you will. I would, I, I'll need a lot more people than 1,000 people to, to even just pay my salary every year after lunch. So, appreciate that, Micah. Don't forget the people off of Twitch. They don't mind, you know, promoting your game for you. Yeah. So I want to, that, that's, I've been thinking about that and trying to understand, you know, the different, what kinds of games they like to play, what components of those games enable them to have comedy, to give them the ability to have an enjoyable stream to watch. Uh, and, try to at least consider it and put some of that in to just I kind of want to be to the point where like I don't even have to go to them like beg them to play the game that just someone asked them to play the game and they're like obviously I'll pay, play this game and they're asking me to play the game and if that's the perspective that's how I get wide more widespread adoption um, I just don't know what the secret sauce is yet So if anyone has any connections to people that have large audiences, either on YouTube or uh, any streaming platform like Twitch, that'd be great. Nope. Oh, I know Bert Black, kind of. Oh, cool. He has about 4,000 people that watch him sometimes. I mean, oh, that'd, that'd be, that would yeah. be an icebreaker right there. Yeah. All right. I'll, I'll maybe touch on your shoulder uh, in a year or so. So you say your game is done. Like, we'll say you said August or a year is done. Well, we're going to go first to, like, promote it, like, uh, to Epic or something? So in about a year, I'll have kind of this, like, open preview where I'll have a, a, a lot of initial content, but it won't be done done. And at that point, I'm going to be, you know, I might even be going to Epic earlier than that to just try to get a mega grant to be able to hire other people to help me build the game. That works. Um I don't think Epic's going to be able to. Well, you know, that's that that would be like a stepping uh, away in the door. If they do go in it, they can see that I can take this money and I can put it back into other people's salaries and make something better that the community likes. Then maybe they'll follow on with another grant. You know, these are all like really big hypotheticals. And, um, you know, we've seen that. Epic has gotten behind other games like Rocket League and things like that. Um, they may be interested in putting more money if they really enjoy it, but that's really far-fetched dream. I just think at some point they will, if I might get two grants max, and then after that they will either acquire or not put any more money. And I think the first grant is difficult and it gets exponentially difficult past that. So I'm going to try to figure out different monetization strategy or not marketing strategies um that aren't super cost prohibitive um i have a little bit of a budget uh for things like that but it that you know it runs out real quick and marketing is expensive so i don't know if it's reddit ads or twitter ads or um if it's like i maybe i try to get one like a a, a, a popular youtuber streamer that accepts paid um playing um I, I don't know what those options look like um but ideally i'd like to somehow get the game featured where, somewhere that has a lot of eyes whether that's paid ads or if it's uh some sort of like sponsorship by somebody like like a streamer or something like not sponsorship but something like that or um probably reaching out to publishers along the ways to see if we can try to find a way to get more money even post launch so that we can keep building the game. Uh, if we don't have a clear uh, growth strategy or the growth isn't happening fast enough for launch and that we need to add like more packs and just have, it just might be a time thing with more advertising. Um, yeah, I know what you mean. There's a, there, well, the way Twitch works is that, they get paid just from people watching them. Like right. that's how it works. So 
and Burke has about six or five other people that play he plays with and one of them is cream he gets about ten thousand people but if you're getting multiplayer burke would definitely pull him into it cool yeah that that that's usually a great way to get more eyes onto the game like that's a really easy way to get people to not just see the game but the gameplay and it ends up being kind of it's sponsorship it's they chose to play this game on stream um and usually ends up being free yeah. Because they get paid and I get people. So, yeah, we'll see. I, th- I think there's a lot of questions and I, there's a lot of research I've got to do over the next year to figure out um, where I start taking that. Yeah, and I just to, to you know piggyback off of your comment about looking for publishers, too. Something to keep in mind is that you want to really flesh out what your monetization strategy is <laughs> if you want to attract right. a publisher for a free game. Yeah. Like they're not gonna they they don't they won't care about any of the the cool things about it. All they're gonna right. care about is whether or not they can make some money. Otherwise, why are they gonna put money into you? Um, so yeah. if you have a, a clear answer for that, you can say this is how this works. This is how we have a you know a steady cash flow. Um, that's all that's gonna matter, and you want to prioritize that if it's a publisher that you're gonna go with. Cool. Thanks. I just fear you're gonna get overwhelmed. Like, okay, I got too many people playing this game. I'm crashing. Oh no. That is the best problem to have. <laughs> if the servers become unavailable, as long as I, you know, fix them, then there's like this br- not brief, but there's a moment where people can't play the game. And then people realize there's too many people playing the game. As long as that number is like a thousand and not twenty, right? Um, but that's a good problem to have as long as it doesn't keep happening and outages don't last more than 24 hours. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, come on now. I want to play. Come on now. <laughs> right. Because eventually at some point people just say, Oh, they don't know what they're doing. And they just kind of like lose faith pretty quickly. Yeah. That's the, that's gotta be careful with that one. Yeah. The other thing to problem. consider too, is that if you're doing an MMO, uh, you also can't have too many times when it feels empty. You don't want to end up with, people joining and having no servers be popular too, which is a big risk. So you might want to think about how you can scale um, your crowd size. Like I, I think of it in, you know, venue terms of it. I'm sure this applies to MMOs as well. If you have a, a, you know, a music venue and you want to have a band play a show in it and they have a draw of 50 and the venue holds 500, it's not going to be a successful show. Even if 50 is a good, crowd for them uh, because the venue is too big. So you can kind of play with that with your game too, right? If you have right. you know, a smaller number of players, maybe think about ways to scale your world so that it doesn't feel totally empty when not that many people are mm. participating. Interesting. And that's something I've noticed a lot with like um, I've, I've played like Battlefield 1 a lot online and uh, just a couple times joining and having an empty server is really dis- like it'll it'll put people off really quickly because <laughs> yeah. they're crowd animals and they want to go where everybody else is. <laughs> hmm. But if you can make it so it, they never feel like they're alone, like there's always, you know, the world scales down to fit whatever number of players you have that will go a long way towards making it feel like a, a game that people want to play. Hmm. It's really interesting idea. I got I got some thoughts on that. Yeah. I also I don't talk about current. It's like a really huh? A currency. Um, we have not talked about currency, and um, that's just uh, another. TBD thing. Um, I think there will be in-game currency and in-game premium currency, and I guess it comes down to uh, where that applies and what kind of economic, like what kind of MMO economies can come out of that, and what is it troublesome? And I mean, there's a lot of studies on how it can be an issue. But long story short, is I don't have the answers to that other than. Uh, it'd be great if you can use some sort of in-game currency to, like, upgrade your guild hall uh, if you wanted to work for it. And maybe it's 
maybe it's in game currency or it's experience. I don't know what it is exactly. Uh, and then you could maybe fast track the customization by purchasing premium currency to use it. And that together between your five people, one maybe one person puts the five dollars down and everyone else kind of just like they play the game and put in their in-game currency and together they can collectively try to get to that next uh, guild hall upgrade or something like that. Um, outside of that, I don't know, you know, how things drop currency or loot. Um, it's a lot of systems that are not designed yet um, that are found in typical MMOs. And I just don't, I don't, I don't know yet. Not sure if you had any follow up on that, Jesse. Hannah, I was just wondering, like, uh, the incentives to, like, participate in, like, the live events and besides just, like, I guess, like, capturing the flag sort of deal. Yeah. Um, I, get, I'm guess, I guess I'm confused. Well, it's just like um, I was thinking about why people play MMOs and what they get excited mm -hmm. about and why they want their friends to play with them like continuously instead of just like, hey, let's play this game. And then they play it for like a month and then they find a different game to play. Like, how do you keep right. them engaged? Like, I know me and Nick play Guild Wars 2 and like the more time you put in a game like that, the more like gold you acquire and then the more customization you can do for your character, for example. So that's why I was asking about currency is like customization. Yeah. Um, it's just something I'm going to have to spend some more time to think about. And one thing I noticed when you were talking about the, the potion system too, is that you had sort of like a, a prototype idea for having um, potions need to be cooked over like a period of, of real not in-game time, but actual time. You could mm -hmm. use that to kind of drive people towards coming back to it too, right? Like, like if people have, you know, um, a, like a thing that they're waiting for to be done. <laughs> and there's there's game turns for this too. Like, at Elder Scrolls, um, the mobile version that they released was infamous for exactly this, which was like uh, timers before you can open a a loot box. Uh, but you could use some of those concepts, maybe a little bit less predatory. <laughs> <laughs> but the same idea <laughs> to kind of like encourage people to, to say like, oh, I have a thing that I left going in the game yesterday that I want to come back to tomorrow. It's my potions. I've got them stacked up and potions have value in game. So, you know, once they're, they're done cooking, I can use them. If they're rare, I can sell them on a, a market or whatever. Right. I guess that's how EVE Online worked too, right? Like you had to yeah. mine stuff in real time. Yeah, like you can, you can like, and I think they used it to kind of balance too. So you didn't end up getting, and I, I, played it like maybe once a long time ago but it was supposed to be something where you like either spent the whole time playing and you got advantages because you were actually in game or if you left it alone you weren't just totally left behind because you could have mining happen outside of it too I, I don't i can't speak to exactly how it works so there's something like that um yep. That's yeah. the tough thing with MMOs, right? If you want to compete with yeah. with the big ones, they all have people who are are dedicated to just playing them nonstop, and they have a limited amount of time. Like somebody who's a, a serious WoW player isn't going to pick up another MMO on the side. <laughs> like right. they want to they want to grind. So if you can build systems that allow people to to continue interacting with your game, but don't ask them to be um, Rockland players only, it will help you uh, pull in an audience. I think. And I think that's great because I'm not trying to compete with the big games. I'll I, there's no way I could compete unless I have like million, you know, tens of millions of dollars of investment kind of deal. Yeah. Um, or I somehow attract large crowds. Um, yeah. And so I think those are some really good ideas to try to complement uh, current MMO players' uh, schedules. Yeah. Like potions, one could just it couldn't just be like you have to let it wait and cook and be done. It could just be like, well, your potion, your this next step of the potion needs to happen for the next five to fifteen days, and you have to come in between those five and fifteen days to move it to the to do the next step of the potion, um, and yeah. otherwise it burns, kind of deal. And, yeah, exactly. And yeah, 
Hey, you like, I take a cue also from um, uh, games like like Gum or the, all the ones where you 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 know build a thing, but then people can raid it while you're out of the game. Um, mm-hmm. And like use a little bit of punishment, <laughs> like you're kind of describing that, where your your potion needs you to check back in after X amount of days, and if you don't, then it it fails to brew. It doesn't have to be mean, but a little bit of like carrot and stick incentive to have people come check in again would help right. you go a long way. I think. A lot of great ideas. Appreciate it all. Anything else? Anybody else have final thoughts for Mike? I think that's it. Well, thanks again for doing this presentation, Mike. And and thanks for everyone else who came and uh, took the time to to ask questions and give Mike feedback. Hopefully it was uh, useful for you, Mike. Yeah, very useful. Thanks again, Nick and Jesse, for uh, organizing this and, and giving me a platform and a support group for me to um, to get some feedback. It's very helpful, and um, I'm really excited to see where this goes and, and get your feedback along the way um, as the game gets more serious and, and, and more time has been put into it. So I really appreciate everything. Yeah, we're looking forward to seeing it grow. Got no, that? I hope everyone... Sorry, go ahead. You have a lot of cool ideas. Your passion for the whole magic thing and everything is is cool. It's interesting. Cool. Thanks. Mm-hmm. Well, I hope everyone has a good weekend. And uh, thanks again for taking the time to listen to me. <laughs>